kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Dead people bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. Blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you are the lion. You are the sacrificial lamb who took away the sins of the world. And Lord, there's nothing we can do to earn it, and we definitely don't deserve it. But Lord, it's a free gift that um, we greatly, greatly appreciate. So Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to those who are listening, those who are here with us, Lord. May they sense your presence. Lord, may you continue to change us and transform us into the image of your Son, because, Lord, we can't do that on our own. We need the power of your Holy Spirit working and moving 
within each and every one of us. Lord, may your name be lifted up this evening. In all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome home, everybody. Welcome those of you watching online. Glad that you're here with us. Just a reminder, this Sunday, um, some Sunday schools will be opening back up. Um, your teachers should have contacted you by now, if you are. So, um, also, Kids Church will be this Sunday as well. I know some of you out there were waiting until uh, Kids Church was available to bring the family back, so we hope uh, you feel comfortable enough to come out, and if not, that's okay too. And I'm trying to think, there's 8.45, okay, this Sunday we're going back to our normal service times, first service 8.45, Sunday school at 10, second service at 11, Kids Church will be at 11 for the, for the kids, and I do believe that is it. All right, God bless. Purity. 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 It's a direction. A persistent and determined pursuit. It is freedom from all that contaminates. It is without anything foreign or inappropriate. It is not just the appearance of good in our actions. But the truth of good in our hearts and minds. It just doesn't happen by accident. It is a decision and constant discipline of the mind. Purity. 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 It's a direction. A persistent and determined pursuit. It is freedom from all that contaminates. It is without anything foreign or inappropriate. It is not just the appearance of good in our actions. But the truth of good in our hearts and minds. It just doesn't happen by accident. It is a decision and constant discipline of the mind to meditate on truth. That is? Whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, and whatever is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. It is choosing to meditate on these things. It is counter opposite to humanity's natural condition, yet needed so desperately within the world stage of media, politics, and church pulpits. It's a virtue hard pressed to find, and often ridiculed by those who live it out. Purity. 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 Why have we forgotten you? Amen. How many of you would like to see more purity in our nation today? Amen. I know you would. Uh, this is still a series that I started three weeks ago about uh, qualities that attract God's favor. I want to remind you uh, that this is not a series to tell you how to work yourself into heaven. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there are things that God's word says that when we do them, he will respond in certain ways. So these are qualities that attract the favor of God. Anybody here want the favor of God? Sure you do. And when we start talking about what are the qualities, let's just stop and ask, have, uh, have you ever thought about what it means that we were made in the image of God? We were made in the image of God. Well, what does that look like? Be honest with you, made in the image of God, we sure have a problem in the church today where the identity of the church, let me give an example, found out some new statistics uh, that came in from Garlow, the guy who pastors Skyline Wesleyan Church. They did a large survey and they found out 72% of the churches in America no longer feel that you have to follow the principles of scripture to make it to heaven, 72%. Uh, I, I'd be honest with you, that, those are scary numbers for me. And, and so what I'm saying is, if we're going to truly be the people of God, we need to have his image, and that image takes on certain qualities so that those qualities then bring about God's favor. So in, in talking about that stuff, tonight we are going to talk about purity. Purity is not something that a lot of people talk about anymore. I can't remember the last time that I heard a message on purity. In fact, somebody might have already turned us off uh, digitally just because you're thinking, oh, that's something that was done in the old school churches. Let me, let me explain something. The Bible hasn't changed, and the things of God have not changed, and the principles that we need to see. And, and there, we're going to see scripture today, especially 2 Corinthians 7, 1, where it really tells us that this is something that we need to talk about. In fact, there's a, there's a phrase at the end of 2 Corinthians 7, 1, that talks about we won't receive from God if we have purity missing. 
So these are very important things. Purity is not something, listen, purity is not something that we obey. And the video was kind of wrong in one phrase. You can't discipline yourself to be pure. You can't obey to be pure. Purity comes as a quality that God gives us in a supernatural act of grace. You need God to put purity in you. So as we preach this tonight, know this, that only God can really give it to you. But at the same time, it's not only something that God puts in us, but here's this is important, and this is about the rest of the message. It is something that we must guard to keep it. If we're going to stay pure, it's something that we need to be diligent about when the Bible says, guard your hearts. That's a part of what we're talking about. John Stott, John R. Stott, a great theologian from the UK, wrote this about purity. Every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure fantasy, wallow in self-pity, we are sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger around bad company whose insidious influence we know we won't be able to resist, Every time we lie in bed when we ought to be up and praying and we know God wants us to, every time a Christian views pornographic literature, every time a Christian takes the risk and restraining and self-control, we are sowing, he says, we are sowing, sowing, sowing to the flesh. That's how we need to, we need to make sure that the very behaviors of our lives need to be pure, come from a pure source. Obviously, that's the Holy Spirit. So you see, when we allow impure things to enter our lives and our faith, it shuts our faith progress down. When churches intentionally allow, this is where I brought up that quote from Garlow's study, 72% of the churches. This is what scares me. When we see churches compromising and allowing impurity into the church itself, we are being bombarded then with, with judgments and we're being bombarded with things from above that we need to get right again and we need to get back to purity. Christians need to get back to purity, living pure lives. And when they intentionally allow to coexist with immorality, it puts the blessings on hold. Sinfulness and faithfulness cannot live together. So we go to this. What are spiritual impurities? Spiritual impurities can distort biblical sexuality. We see churches and we see the body of Christ giving into non-biblical versions of sexuality. That's an aversion. Uh, that's an example of uh, spiritual impurities. It also embellishes greed. Uh, you know, it causes, even within believers, the worship of money and possessions. Materialism, which is what some, some theologians today believe may be one of the largest problems in the Christian church. Or encourage mind-altering drugs. Sometimes we have people in the body of Christ that are participating in mind-altering drugs. And it draws us, whenever we allow impurities in our lives, it will draw us to rebel against God. And last, these, this is another big one. Spiritual impurities can help to harbor anger and bitterness against people or, or circumstances. So again, to prove it, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 is our biblical insight for the day. And I wish to express my burden today and a compulsion to preach this at what I feel is a very pivotal moment in our nation. Purity is a topic that resisted, is resisted by the world. Sadly, it is also resi resisted in the church because purity is the call to be free from contamination and immorality. So just before I read our text, let me give you a, lay down, a, a lowdown of what Paul is saying here in, in the background of 2 Corinthians. Paul's just poured out his soul to the Corinthians in chapter 6. And in fact, at verses 1 and 2, he pleads with them to not receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't miss the importance, Paul is saying. He tells them that, that today is the day of our salvation. Despite the amount of suffering Paul has gone through, he pleads for them in verse 12 to see the barrier of their own affections. They weren't pure is what he was saying. He then writes that verse that we're all familiar with, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Again, take your, don't allow yourself to be unequally yoked uh, with unbelievers that will bring impurity into your lives. 
Light doesn't befriend darkness. That doesn't mean that Christians can't have lost friends. What it means is that though the light in us cannot coexist with the darkness in them, our job is to make sure we share the light. We turn the light on so that they can see the darkness in their own lives. Righteousness doesn't hang out on a Friday night with lawlessness. And Jesus doesn't Facebook Satan. So he tells the Corinthians that they are the temple of the living God. God dwells in us as Christians. He lives in us. He walks with us every day. And he's proud of us. And because of that, Paul then says these words, come out from among them and be separate. Now let me, let me kind of give you a little, a little microcosm of what he's saying. Come out from among them. Come out from among impure things. Come out from among those people that are impure, that influence you in the negative ways. He goes on to say, says the Lord, and then, this is the important, you, you can't get the rest of the message and tell you this, and then he will receive you. Did you catch that? Be separate. Be out, be, that's sanctified. Be out of and pulled away and separate be separate says the lord and when you decide to be different than the world he will receive you anybody say wow that's a calling that most in fact a lot of christians don't hear be different than the world and so as we we see that let me Go on, it says here, uh, therefore having these promises, this is, this is 7-1, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The NIV actually says it this way, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates both body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence. For God. Now let me, let me quickly get back to chapter 6. There's some promises that are mentioned like this. God promises to dwell with us. Amen. God promises to walk with us. Amen. God promises to own us as his people. Yes. God promises to receive us as a father loves his family, but those promises are negatively impacted without purity. Because of those promises, we are encouraged to cleanse ourselves from all the things that contaminate both body and spirit again. Then Paul says, we must fear God. We must fear God without it. So let me give you the big idea of the, day, of the evening. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And when you have made Christ the Lord of your life, purity will be present. So if you want purity, if you really want that element that attracts the favor of God, you've got to make Christ the Lord of your life. The Holy Spirit must be your hunger and thirst for because he brings to us all that we need. So how's your, how's your purity doing today? Let me just quickly give you the outline for the day. See, the biblical study in the area of purity, I, I found, I personally, I know, no, no, I know there's more, but I would like to share the four that I found, the four areas of purity. The first is simply this, purity as a child of God. Ephesians 1.4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. That's that purity statement. Holy without blame before him in love. He refers to us, in fact, in John 3, 29, as a bride who belongs to the bridegroom. Now, if you still follow the bride and the bridegroom's story, you will know that it's without spot or wrinkle. God wants his bride to be pure. God chose us before the creation of the world to love us, to dwell with him, with him in perfect communion. But we have to be purely his, purely his, a clean bride. That's not just the church allowing some black sheep to roam. No, that's you too, being pure, a child who longs to please his heavenly father without filth. 
be honest with you, I, I could simplify, you don't, please don't leave now, but I could simplify the whole message to say this, that purity can only be found and kept when our affections, our hungering and our thirsting for righteousness is constantly evident. So we, we become purely his when we eliminate all competitors and affections and consecrate, consecrate our whole lives to him. We sell out to the value system of scripture. We have a worldview, Christian worldview. I've told you the story before about the Scottish preacher, John McNeil, who loved the story where he showed up one day and he, he saw an eagle that had been captured when it was quite young. And the farmer who actually caught the eagle snared the bird, restrained it so it couldn't fly. And then he turned it loose to roam in the barnyard. It wasn't long till the eagle began to act like the chickens and scratching and pecking at the ground. And this bird that once soared high in the heavens seemed satisfied to live the barnyard life of the lowly hen. Well, one day the farmer was visited by a shepherd who lived in the mountains where eagles lived. And seeing that eagle, the shepherd looked at the farmer and said, what a shame to keep that bird hobbled there in your barnyard. Why don't you let it go? And the farmer who had had it long enough said, you know what, I'm going to do that. So he gave uh, the, the shepherd this eagle. He cut off the restraint. And the eagle continued to wander around like chickens, scratching and pecking as before. But the shepherd took it and picked it up and then placed it on a high stone wall where the eagle could finally see for the first time in months what he had been missing. He saw the grand expanse of the blue sky and the glowing sun, and it spread its wings with a leap, soared off into a tremendous spiral flight. Up, up, and up he went. At last it was acting like it was born to act. You see, we were born to be pure. When God saved you, he gave you a new birth. You, you, gave, you became a new creature in Christ. God wanted at that moment the beginning of purity to develop in your life because of his presence, not held down by the chains of this world. There are so many Christians who have allowed chains on their lives when what God says is allow me to set you free so you can experience the life of purity. And secondly, purity is being separate from the world. I've kind of already hit that before. You know Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Conformed, the term, means to not only fashion yourself to the world, but that the world, and this is how the Greek lays it out, you, you are, you're not supposed to, or in this case, being conformed to the world means you look like the world, and by the way, while you're looking like the world, the most unstable world is that one. So, being transformed, it's got to be a hunger. That's why repentance, my friends, is a 180 degree turn. It is no longer headed down the same path that we lived when we were lost in our trespasses and sins. When we were living impure lives, we were going one direction. When God saved us, we went another direction. And that new direction is not supposed to look like the old one. It is a new life, a new creation, a new direction, and we are not supposed to play with or mess with sin anymore. Number three, purity is seeking righteousness. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the, this is the phrase, incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. A gentle and quiet spirit, by the way, is one of the qualities of a pure life. But incorruptible beauty, the Greek word there is also referring to humility and having a rest internally. In other words, bottom line, being purely righteous means that our number one priority is to, listen, I know some are, I'm going to get emails on this one, I'm sure. 
But let me just say this, that our number one priority is to impress Christ with our internal being. In other words, not that somehow we're going to get kudos, we're going to get brownies and, and somehow... No, what that means is we want God to see that we love Him so much that He's going to like what's happening inside of us. How's that going? Are you living that life? We all need to live that life. Peter doesn't condemn outer beauty. By the way, you read this passage and a lot of people freak out. And, oh, no, here we go. Hair length, dresses, pants, all that kind of stuff. And No, there's, there's something much more important in this passage. The inner beauty, kindness, an incorruptible conscience, a quiet spirit that doesn't fade with age. You know what? I, I, I like, there, there have been people in my, lives, my life that as they got older they got greater. You ever met somebody like that? The older they got, the more you wanted to be around them because they kept growing. They kept becoming. They were becoming more beautiful and holy and they were righteous people that you just wanted to be around because you knew if you hung around them long enough, you were going to get something good that day. Something said marvelous that day from the Lord because they were that close to the Lord. I, my, um, my wife and I, started out our, our dating relationship this way. Um, I borrowed my boss's Cadillac. Of course, I needed to impress her with the Cadillac. And, and in fact, to be honest with you, he looked at, he, he's, he was David Smith, the preacher. It was his car. Well, he gave me his Cadillac, and, and he said, son, don't drive that thing you've been driving. He said, take that cab, take my Cadillac, drive it up there. And so I, I've, I've, meant, I've told this story before, but I put on white pants and a very bright summer top. And I have often said, for those of you that have been around long enough to know Miami Vice, I, I did my best Don Johnson impression as I could. Well, I think I told you this story too. When I got to Lancaster to pick her up, I was having problems with air and attire. So I stopped, and when I, when I stopped to, to, to check it, I got tire black on my white pants. To be honest with you, that tire mark messed me up the rest of the night. Messed me up. Even though, you know, that was the day, I, I won't go through all the details, it was, it, God worked that out. <laughs> There's no way I was going to get somebody like her without Jesus involved. Okay. But what, but the rest of the night, it bugged me that my pursuit of a girlfriend would see that black mark. We, we need to live lives in such a way that if we allow impurities and sin in our lives, it bugs us. And we pray about it. And we say, God, I'm sorry. Clean this mess up. Cleanse me. Get rid of that spot. Lord, the last thing I want to do is to spend our intimate time together with me constantly looking at that. Righteousness. We need to purify by seeking righteousness. And last, purity. We need to have purity in our testimony. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10 says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with priority, uh, propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Once again, that, that can be used, that passage of Scripture has been used as a hammer in the past to beat up on, on people trying, trying to live lives for Christ. And I have heard, maybe many of you have heard of, those that are in the digital world and those that are here, maybe you've heard somebody actually use one of those items to make somebody feel guilty. But I want you to know there's something else here, more important. You see, the question is simply this. Why would, why would Paul write that stuff unless it was more this? Hear me. How are you advertising Jesus with your behavior and your apparel. 
In other words, if we act and dress in such a way to draw attention to ourselves and to pull the affections of improper, pull improper affections from others, then that, my friends, is a purity problem. You see, if the Heavenly Father is your eternal affection, then the outer apparel is marketing righteousness with modesty for Him. In other words, it's important how we walk. It's important how we talk. It's important how we dress. It's important how we live. It's important how we show ourselves because we are not showing ourselves, we're showing Christ in us. And so when we do these things, you know, it's important that we understand God wants to know, God wants us to know that the whole world is upside down. And that beauty starts not on the outside, but on the inside. Can I get an amen from the people in the house? So don't let shallow religion or shallow friends tell you, hear this, Christian. Don't let shallow people in church or shallow people who are of other churches or religions or shallow friends tell you that purity is no longer a concern in the lives of Christians. Tell them that God says that we're to have it, and that settles it. I've also often told the story of the 1982 Falkland Islands conflict. Uh, I'll just get right to the punch. The, uh, this ship, which was called the HMS Sheffield, you see, the, the British had a great defensive system uh, on their naval, naval ships. And, and in fact, the computers, the radar computers, could detect what, what particular missiles were launched toward their ships. So the computer could register what the, what the particular missile was and then send, knowing that it was an enemy uh, missile, it would then send another to, to put it out of the sky. Well, that particular ship, got to let you know, that, that ship was sunk. The computer saw a missile, registered it as friendly. They had taken a French-made model and put it on their aircraft. And they had, they had sent a missile that seemed to be friendly. That ship knew that missile was coming but its defense system failed them. Let me just close with this. How's your defense system? Is there purity in your heart that sees something coming and says, no, not for me? Does your defense system using the whole armor of God. And Ephesians 6, talk about there are things in this world that would love to have me and they're not going to get me because I have chosen to live a pure life, purely His, the rest of my life. I'm trying. I'm trying to build up my defense system. The devil's the best at what he does, but I know this. Every one of us, whether by camera or here, we need to make a choice. God, cleanse me, make me pure, so that inside of me I will have something that opposes what the enemy is trying to do. Yes, it involves the Holy Spirit. So it's something that we call the prayer of entire sanctification. You see, we're sanctified when we're saved. But there's still a nature that needs to be dealt with that's seen in 1 John 1, 7 and 9, where it talks about we need God, God to take out of us that which is friendly to sin, bent to sin, and give us the power to say no, give us the power to not be angry, Give us the power to turn away from that which would drag us into the depths of hell. God, make our defense system strong. 
Let your Holy Spirit cleanse me. This is a prayer you need to pray. May the Holy Spirit cleanse my heart and give me the power that Acts 1-8 talks about so that I can be victorious in my life. Would you pray with me, please? God, just as your scripture says, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness all in the fear of God. God, make us where so many are watching television and somehow making social justice their God. Yes, we need social justice, but God, we need you more. And Lord, may we be a sanctified people that shows the love of Christ, that can say no to the things that the devil's trying to do, and so we can say yes to righteousness as you provide it. Lord, reboot our purity. Cleanse us. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a good evening.